Saul was consenting to Stephen's death. We remember that. Uh, when Stephen was being stoned, they laid their coats at a young man's feet, and his name was Saul. And, you know, Saul was very religious. He uh, was probably more zealous than anybody in his day to defend Judaism. And, of course, Judaism had backslidden into nothing more than a religion. And uh, you have to be careful. Uh, about religious folks because they're dangerous. And uh, he said, Brother Harris, what are you talking about? I'm talking about there's a personal, real, genuine relationship that every human being can have with Jesus Christ. I'm not endorsing religion. I'm not up here lifting up any religious institution or, or denomination. He said, what, what's your purpose? I'm here to lift up Jesus. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Amen. You know, if you want to know a little bit more about me let, me, let me just introduce myself. I'm a man called of God, anointed with the Holy Ghost. Uh, I'm born again by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. I believe in living a sanctified life from the world. I am filled with the Holy Ghost, with the evidence of speaking in tongues as the Spirit gives utterance. And Jesus is who I worship. Jesus is who I promote. And I want to tell you something. I'm a kingdom builder. Anybody in the world that loves Jesus and wants to serve him, I'm, I'm on your side. Hallelujah. But we read about a man here that was religious that was not on Jesus' side. And the Bible makes it clear that hatred, not love, but hatred motivated Saul to persecute, kill and imprison those that believed in the way. <laughs> in the way. Notice here, Jesus' enemies referred to their faith in him as the, the way. I wonder, if, I wonder if the early church was qu quoting uh, uh, over there in John, hallelujah, chapter 14, verse 6, where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man can come to the Father but by me. I wonder if that was their message. I wonder if that was the battle cry of the first century church that if you want to go to heaven, you had to come to Jesus Christ because he is the only way. Hallelujah. He is the only way. Listen to me, folks. There is no other way. Judaism is not the way. Islam is not the way. <laughs> There is no other way you will ever overcome the world. Listen to me. Let this soak in. There's no other way you'll overcome this world and get to heaven except by a personal relationship of Jesus Christ. Think about that tonight, folks. What are you trusting in? Saul was trusting in the law of Moses. And this religion and this legalism and this law had driven him to madness. And he hated those that had believed on Jesus. You know, he was a murderer. I want to tell you a little bit about Saul. Saul was guilty of murdering Christians, tearing up homes. The Bible says, and when the Bible says something, it means what it says and says what it means. He was making havoc of the church. I don't know if you can understand that. He was making the Christians' lives miserable. Breaking and tearing up homes, separating children from their families. I don't, I don't know how deeper in sin a person could get than Saul here in his motive to destroy this new born-again church of Jesus Christ. Listen to me carefully. You know, the church was going to be persecuted. Jesus warned the the, the saints early, early on in his ministry. If you take a stand for Jesus Christ, you're going to suffer some form of persecution uh, from the outside world. The world, Jesus said, don't love men and ain't going to love you. Hallelujah. So we shouldn't expect anything else uh, than to be persecuted from the, from the world. The world don't understand they're blind in sin. And many are religious like Saul. 
If you hate Christianity, and if you hate the Lord of Christianity, Jesus, listen to me carefully. You're being motivated by Satan. You're blinded by the devil because Jesus is the son of the living God. Hallelujah. Folks, it's a historical fact and a biblical fact. It's a prophetic fact that he is the begotten son of God the Father. And the only way you can get to heaven, be forgiven of your sins, is to come and know Jesus Christ in a personal way. And you know, when Stephen was being stoned, the Bible says through the anointing of the Holy Spirit, he looked up into heaven and he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father, ready to receive him as a martyr into that celestial city. Listen to me carefully. Under the anointing, Stephen cried out, don't lay this sin to their charge, Lord. I believe, I teach, preach, and maintain that I believe then Saul came under conviction. The Holy Ghost will do one or two things to you. It'll make you run from Christ or it'll make you run to Christ. There ain't no middle ground. Glory, hallelujah. I said there ain't no middle ground. The Holy Ghost will bring you under conviction and he will bring you your knees, hallelujah, before that old rugged cross or he'll put flat in your feet and you'll run from the Lord. Ain't no middle ground. You ain't no part-time Christian. You ain't no half-time Christian. You're either all the way in or you're all the way out. The scripture tonight finds Saul all the way out. But a beautiful thing is fixing to happen. Jesus wanted this pesky murderer, hallelujah, to become his servant. Only Christianity, hallelujah, declares these kind of revelations to a lost and dying world. Only true Christianity to, can take a murderer and turn him into a saint. Only Jesus can take a drunkard and make them whole. Only Jesus can deliver the drug addict and set them free. Only Jesus, hallelujah, can take your feet out of hell, hallelujah, and place them on a path toward heaven. Only Jesus can redeem the lost. Only Jesus can take you and change you in a radical way. We're, we're going to hear a story tonight how that Saul saw the light. And as he journeyed, came near to Damascus, the third verse, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. Folks, what happened to Saul was Jesus appeared to this man as he was going into Damascus to continue to persecute, kill, and arrest Christians. And the Bible says when he came into contact with a light from heaven, he fell to the earth. Now, I've heard it preached that he fell off his mule. I've heard it preached that he fell off his donkey. And I've heard it preached that I'm going to preach that he fell to the ground because that's what the Bible says. Hallelujah. Whether or not he was on a horse, donkey, or walking, he fell to the ground when he came into contact with Jesus. And he heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Woo, we can stop right here and preach. Listen to me, folks. When you are under persecution, I said when the devil is using somebody like Saul to make your life miserable because you love Jesus and because you're serving Jesus, I want you to know and understand and never forget this again when they talk about you, lay their hand on you, when they gossip about you, they are doing it more to you. They are doing it to Jesus. He takes it personal when his believers are suffering in his name. Hallelujah. 
I don't know about y'all, but I caught that over there when Stephen was being stoned to death. Jesus took it personal. The Bible declares that he has sat down at the right hand of the Father forever. But when Stephen was being stoned to death, Jesus stood up from the throne, looked down on his servant, and gave him grace to die. Hallelujah. It's good to be a child of God. It's good, hallelujah, to know Jesus Christ in the full pardon of your sins. Hallelujah. Oh, Saul ran into Jesus on his way to persecute the church. And notice here, when he had a contact with Jesus, he fell on his face. Hallelujah. You know, today I don't mean this ugly. I'm going to say this with a tender, loving heart. I believe you can get saved in the cornfield. I believe you can get saved in the woods. I believe you can get saved at home. I believe you can get saved in the village. Hallelujah, in a third world country. I believe you can get saved here in this church tonight. I believe you can get saved in a car driving down the road or an airplane flying uh, 20,000 feet up in the sky. But let me tell you something. Uh, when you come into contact with Jesus Christ, when he presents himself to you or he is presented to you, hallelujah, if your heart is right, you are going to fall for him. Uh, I said you are going to fall for him and you're not going to be ashamed of who he is. We got folks today that calls themselves Christians. They never pray. They never come to an altar or even go to a church to go to an altar. Are you listening to me? I want to tell you today, I was praying and seeking the Lord. Hallelujah. And right there in my office at home, I felt a great need to fall down on my face before God and bless the name of Jesus Christ. I'm not ashamed of him. You should never be ashamed of being a Christian. Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me in this wicked and all adulterous generation, I'll be ashamed of you when you stand before the Father and the holy angels. Read here and glean these beautiful truths. Suddenly, there shall shine round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, I want to read this again, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Hallelujah. See there, I told you, he was under conviction. This phrase here, it's hard for you to resist me. It's hard for you to oppose me. It's tearing you up to persecute my church. I am Jesus, the Lord of the people you are killing and putting in prison. I am their Lord and Savior, and I am your Lord and Savior. Listen to me carefully. Whether you're a Christian or not, whether you ever will be or not, one of these days, you are going to bow down before him and you are going to beg him for mercy. You might as well go on and do it today because Jesus is God. Jesus is God. Jesus is God who come in the flesh and he is the same king of glory that's going to judge every man and he'll judge every man, woman, boy, and girl out of this word right here. Know the truth, the truth shall make you free. Can you imagine? Can you imagine this scenario? Paul falls to the ground and hears the voice of Jesus. Mm. Why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And watch this. This is, this is Saul now. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, 
and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Now do you understand, those of you that have been following me for a while, now do you understand that I preach this, I teach this, and I maintain this doctrine. If you are saved, you will know that you're saved. I said if you really are saved, you will know that you know that you know Jesus in a personal way. Do you see it here? Hallelujah. Who are you? I'm Jesus. Lord, Lord, Lord. Let me tell you something. When you truly surrender your life and soul to Jesus, he will instantly be the Lord of your life. Just hoping I'm saved. And the preacher told me I was. You better fall down on your face. Because you can cry out to the Lord. And he will shine a little light on you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah and glory be to God. I tell you I feel the anointing. Of the Holy Ghost in this study. Go into the city. And it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. Watch this, folks. And he was three days without sight and neither did eat nor drink. This man had a conversion. You say, Brother Harris, why did he go blind? He saw Jesus in his glorified form. He saw Jesus. And when Paul saw Jesus, he refused to look away. He continued to look at him. And the glory of the Lord, I believe, I believe, fried his carnal eyes. I believe the glory of Jesus fried his natural eyes. But it opened up his spiritual eyes. Listen to me carefully. When you really get born again, you won't never see through the same pair of eyes again. You'll be looking through a whole different set of eyes. You'll be looking at the world through Jesus' rose-colored glasses. Paul was blinded at the glory of the Son of Man. You know, it makes me think about John the Revelator. Over in the book of Revelation, chapter 1, John said on the Lord's day, he was praying and seeking the Lord, and he heard a great voice behind him, and he looked to turn and to see the voice that spake with him, a voice that sounded like the rushing of, of many waters. And John said, when I looked at him, he had hair that was white like wool and he was in a golden girdle flowing uh, with beautiful wine and, and that his face looked like the sun shining in its strength. I'm here to tell you, Jesus is not some poor little guy hanging on the cross. Uh, he is the glorified Son of God forever and forever and forever and forever. And he came the first time. He came to be the Lamb of God. He came to be our sacrifice. He came to spill His blood for the sins of the world. But when He comes the second time, He's going to be the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He is going to be the conquering King of kings and Lord of lords. Woe, woe unto those that reject his message, woe unto those that snub their nose at Jesus Christ. He's not a humble little prophet that you can nail on the cross anymore. He's the glorified God. Hallelujah. He's the glorified Son of Man, Son of God. Somebody say glory. glory. Hallelujah. This don't get you shouting. Your boy's wet. The Bible says in verse 10, And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the street, 
which is called straight. Underline that. Go and arise and go into the street, which is called straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth. And hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. So see there, he was blinded by the glory of the Son of God. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. You know, let me stop right here just a moment. You know, when we refer to Christians as saints, did you know that offends some people? Did you know that actually offends some people? <laughs> some people are so arrogant. Some people are so, so spacey that they don't think that God's children can live close enough to the Lord to be referred to as a saint. Yep. Now, are you saying, Brother Harris, that we ought to go back and saint, uh, saint this person and saint that person like the Catholic Church? Oh, no, no, I'm not talking about that at all. I'm here to tell you when a man, woman, boy, girl, no matter how filthy or deep in sin they used to be, when Jesus dips them beneath the blood that was spilt on an old rugged cross, he saves them, he sanctifies them, he justifies them. I said he sets them so free, he clears them from any judgment in the eyes of God all of his children are his saints somebody shout about that tonight amen now watch this watch this he was praying and I said this is a bad guy <laughs> everybody's heard about Saul but the Lord said he's praying. Hallelujah. He is praying. He, he is seeking me. And you know that's what real Christians do. Amen. They, they seek the Lord. Hallelujah. Then Ananias, verse 13. Let's read that again. Answer, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel, underline that, unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Now I want to stop right here and clear up a few things that I've heard here lately that's false. I've heard people try to preach and say that the early church made a mistake in Matthew 1 when they allowed Matthew to be numbered with a 12. Listen to me. <laughs> they say that that should have been the Apostle Paul. Hey, you know, let's just stop and weigh this out. Chapter 1 says Matthew was numbered uh, with the 11. Somebody say amen. I said the word of God says that Matthias was numbered with the 12. Here we read that Paul is called to be an apostle primarily to the Gentiles and to the officials of, of the nations of earth at that time. God's kingdom has got plenty enough room for 12 apostles, hallelujah, and Paul to be a special apostle to the Gentiles. So quit trying to twist God's word up. He said, Brother Harry, well, does it really matter? I think it really matters when the Bible's clear in Acts 1 that Matthias took Judas' place and here the Lord struck down Saul for a specific ministry. So Brother Harris, well, that's why we call this the truth. The truth. Don't you want to know the truth? I want to know the truth. It makes a world of difference to know the difference. The Lord said, I'm going to show him how great things he must suffer for my namesake. Now, Paul had an, an extraordinary experience 
with the Lord, he saw Jesus. <laughs> now, he saw him at a later time, and the Bible confirms that, and I'll show you that when we get there. But I want everybody to mark it in their spirit that on the Damascus Road, Saul, the murderer, saw Jesus in person in a glorified body. That in itself qualifies him to be an apostle. He saw the Lord with his own eyes. And of course, the Lord blinded him so he could heal him so that Paul could look at the world. Hallelujah, a whole different way. Go thy way, verse 15 says. I want you to get this. He is a chosen vessel unto me. Underline this, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Now, I've been asked, Brother Harris, do you believe that the apostle uh, Paul was inferior to the other twelve? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. But twelve apostles, they were called to minister to the twelve tribes of Judah. I mean, twelve tribes of Israel. Amen. They have their specific place, amen, in God's kingdom. Listen to me, folks. God's kingdom is bigger than what you realize. God's kingdom is greater than what you ever imagined. And there is a special place. Oh, Lord, have mercy. I said there is a special place for every single child of God. God is no respecter of persons. There ain't nobody else in the world like you. Nor was there Paul. Nor was there the twelve. Somebody say amen. We are all created by God so unique. That our fingerprints are different. Our DNA is different. And our eternal destiny, hallelujah, is going to be unique. A one-on-one, -on -one personal, eternal relationship with Jesus forever. So don't ever fret about somebody else, what they're doing and you can't do. Just do what you can do for the Lord. Notice here. Notice here. That the Lord says, I'm briefing, I'm briefing him. You go on over and lay hands on him. I'm preparing him for what he is going to suffer for my name's sake. And can I tell you that the Apostle Paul did suffer more than any other of the apostles. And he done two-thirds of the work if you really want to look at the truth, wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. What, what a man. What a man. But tonight I want us to stop right here before I go on. And I want you to clearly see that God can take a nobody, a murderer, a hater, a persecutor, a wicked, motivated man. He can take the worst of the worst, and I'll testify and quote Paul. He said, I was the chief of all sinners. And that's recorded in the scripture. So I'm not going to try to say, well, Paul really wasn't. The Bible says he was. The worst thing that you can do is to persecute the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Woe, woe unto you. That would hurt that would cause harm or injury to the body of Christ. You just don't know how deadly that sin is. Except you repent like Saul. Don't ever, don't ever do anything to hurt the church of the Lord Jesus. You know, the church is in such a bad shape around the world that, you know, when I go into a new region, and this broadcast went over the Africa network. And listen to me carefully. Uh, I, I picked up on a little jealousy here and there from preachers over on that continent. And I'll quickly let them know, I'm not here to take your church. I'm not here to hurt your church. I'm a kingdom builder. I love Jesus. I lift him up. 
I have come to lift him up and the body of Christ up. Every Christian should love the church universal. Somebody say amen. I said every true child of God is going to love the church that Jesus died and bled for. You should never do anything to hurt the church. 